if the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike. This is preeminently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly. History doesn't have to be boring, buttoned up, or inaccessible. And it certainly didn't end in 1945. It belongs to all of us, and we share and add to it every day. Welcome to the History of Go-Go podcast, where I interview interesting guests, cover a motley crew of topics, and it's a place where you can sit, think, and drink all at the same time. I'm your host, Rob Mellon. My guest today is Dr. Carol Birkin. She is a dedicated public historian who has brought early American history to a very wide audience. And she is a pioneer in the field of women's history. She is perhaps best known as an historical commentator for dozens of television documentaries, including PBS, the History Channel, Netflix, and others. And I always enjoy her unique and insightful perspective. Dr. Birkin is an accomplished author having written several books, including A Brilliant Solution, Inventing the American Constitution, First Generations, Women in Colonial America, The Bill of Rights, The Fight to Secure America's Liberties, and Revolutionary Mothers, Women in the Struggle for America's Independence, which will be our topic of discussion today. Of Revolutionary Mothers, The Washington Times writes, compact and informative, one is simply bowled over by the courage and fortitude of these women. She is most definitely a fantastic storyteller, and we are very fortunate to have her with us today. Welcome, Dr. Birkin. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be talking with you. One of the things I'm always interested in is how an author, and I know you've written several books, but how an author chooses the cover. And in this specific cover, this revolutionary mother on the cover has a very determined look. (laughs) Yes. I will tell you the dirty little secret about she is a loyalist. Wow. She is not a revolutionary. Wow. She is about to fire on American troops. (laughs) (laughs) There's a little story behind this. I'll try to make it brief. When Mary Beth Norton and Linda Kerber came out with their big books in 1980 on women in the American Revolution, they used every illustration any of us had ever been able to find. And so when I wrote Revolutionary Mothers, Mary Beth called me up and she said, ha, 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 what what cover are you going to use? Because we've already used them all. And I said, (laughs) you're right. I don't know what I'll do. And my son got into Connecticut College in, in New London, and I went for parents, whatever it was, and they had a little museum there. And I walk in, and there is this magnificent painting that has never appeared in any book, and it was of this woman. And I said, would you mind if I use this as the cover of my book? And I said, we just won't tell people that she's not a a revolutionary. (laughs) She's a loyalist. But I have confessed that to virtually anybody who mentions the cover which goes to prove that the American Revolution was, in fact, a civil war. It pitted Americans against Americans, members of families against one another, in a way that the American Civil War of the 19th century didn't. That was a regional division. But the American Revolution pitted neighbor against neighbor, brother against brother, sister against sister, and One of the things I try to bring out in the book is that that's the case. So the cover fits the book, but it does not fit what most people think it's about. Well, Dr. Birkin, it is tradition here to accompany the conversation with a special brew. Today, we have Everyday Hero Session IPA from Revolution Brewery in Chicago, Illinois. Revolution is Illinois' largest independently owned brewery. Everyday Hero is a modern blend of different hops, which brings a very smooth, tropical flavor to the beer. Remember, the best way to enjoy the podcast is with one of the featured brews, so I hope you join us. If you like History of Go-Go, please subscribe. Simply hit the subscribe button 
on the podcast directory that you use. It is the only way to get brand new episodes immediately after they are released. For more information on guests and shows, like our Facebook page and leave a comment if you'd like. And thank you to the many new listeners, now from 40 countries and hundreds of cities across the United States. And with my everyday hero, and in honor of our revolutionary mothers, I say cheers. Now, America has changed significantly since colonial times, and I have a 19-year-old daughter, and if there were a such thing as a flux capacitor and she could go back in time, uh, back to future style, what would be some of the aspects of how women were treated in colonial society she would recognize and be okay with, and what would be some things she would be completely appalled by? Well, that's a very complicated question. The colonial period lasted, you know, well over 150 years. So if you're talking about the 18th century, say from 1750 on, there are things she would recognize. Also, there was no, the answer to that question is there's no such thing as the American woman ever. It would depend on what race she was. It would depend on what region she lived in. It would depend on what her social class was. What kinds of experiences those women had and what she would recognize in their their experiences. So let's assume, just for argument's sake, that she was a member of what by 1750 were called the genteel classes. That is upper middle class and elite she would recognize that there was a new trend towards something called companionate marriage. That is toward the idea that husbands and wives should like each other (laughs) and that they should (laughs) have something in common. And you can see why that develops among the prosperous classes, because among the ordinary American women and men, There was a division of labor for survival. Women did household manufacturing, that is, turning raw materials into usable items, and they produced the labor force, and men grew the crops. And that's why you got married. You married, if you're a man, you married a woman who was a good housewife, that is, she knew how to spin flax into linen. She knew how to wring the neck of a chicken. She knew how to preserve meat and preserve vegetables. She knew how to make candles. And she assumed that he was willing to labor hard in the field. And loving each other or having a lot in common didn't really matter. Every man needed a wife and every woman needed a husband. But by the time you get to the 1750s, if your daughter arrived then, there would be urban, genteel families where they didn't have to do any of those things. You don't see wealthy women wringing necks of chickens. They could purchase what they needed. And so a wife became and a husband became more of a companion. And I think she would recognize that. Today we have it in the extreme that you have to love each other deeply. And if you don't, you get a divorce. They didn't. Divorce was very rare in the 18th century. But I think she would recognize that idea that two people needed to have something in common. She might even recognize the fact that women took care of the home, which remained the case in poorer families and in genteel families. What she wouldn't recognize or what would seem unbelievable to her is that married women had, in fact, virtually no legal identity. When a woman got married, she was considered woman covered, femme covert, and she couldn't sue or be sued. She couldn't inherit or will property. The clothes on her back belonged to her husband, and her body belonged to her husband. Well, those are those would be fighting words for her. The clothes, yes, of and- course, <laughs> of course. I, I mean, 
she certainly wouldn't have any occupation other than no goal in life. Nothing would be available to her really except to be married and have children. And she would be, I think, rather surprised at the number of children because women bore children every two and a half to three years. And while some of them did not survive, you really spent most of your adulthood either pregnant or nursing children. And that is certainly not what most women of 19 expect out of their life today. And so I I think that the legal status of women and the absence of a political voice, the absence of formal education, the absence, I mean, even among the wealthiest families, the absence of any kind of career choice, any option other than getting married would seem outrageous to a modern young woman today. In your book, you mention how it's often remembered as quaint and harmless. Right. You know, that civil war that you discussed, that isn't quaint. It's destructive. There's serious violence. Yeah. Could you explain how that concept is dangerous? As most Americans see this as our birth myth, you know, and they tend to assume that all was going to go well. I always tell my students, most people think, and then they wrote the Declaration of Independence and they said, of course we're going to win. And so there's a kind of absence of wanting to see in the American Revolution anything other than victory, liberty, freedom, all the really great things that were promised in the Declaration of Independence. It's phenomenal to me. The Civil War in the 19th century lasted four years. The American Revolution was seven and a half years long, and it was fought right in America. It was fought in people's fields. It was fought in their backyards. It was fought in their towns and cities. And it was fought against a brutal and very accomplished army and navy that really did believe to the victor belong the spoils. And one of the spoils was women. Rape was rampant in many places where the British army went. It's also true that most Americans seem today seem to think that all Americans supported independence. That was so untrue. Most historians today would argue that the biggest chunk of Americans in 1776 were neutral. They just didn't care. They felt somebody's going to tax us. We don't care who taxes us. We don't have any political power. So what difference does it make? What drove people to support the American Revolution, I'm talking about the average ordinary farmer was the behavior of the British Army. Everywhere the British Army went, American enlistments increased. It's also true, and it took us a long time to get this into textbooks. It's also true that many of the backcountry farmers in the South who didn't own slaves and who had no representation in the governments of those men that we think of as the great patriots, the planters, they hated George Washington. They hated uh, the Randolphs. They hated the South Carolina planters with a passion. And they wanted the British government to win and hang all of those people. And so in the South, the American Revolution was a violent civil war. It involved massacring the enemy, if you won the battle, there are accounts of atrocities that would curl your hair. Loyalist troops who were fighting for the British and American troops who were fighting for independence would slit pregnant women from their gullet to their crotch to kill them. They offered no quarter in a battle. If the Loyalist troops 
where the British won the battle, they slaughtered the Americans and vice versa. It's a bloody, bloody, bloody many years of warfare. It's an invasion by a British army that went into people's homes and stole everything. I have a quote in the book, Revolutionary Mothers, where a woman says, they stole the buckles off my shoes because I had silver buckles on my shoes. Eliza Wilkinson's home, they took the drapes from the windows. They took the furniture. I mean, this is a terrible, terrible war that for some reason, for many, many years in textbooks was portrayed as, and all the Americans rose up and they fought against the British and they won. And then we started a great nation. And is still resistance to seeing the American Revolution as a civil war and seeing it as a bloody and brutal war. And those of us who work in the field just keep trying to present the evidence that shows this. And when you look at it from women's points of view, I quote these rural women who write to their husbands who are in Washington's army. And they say, as one woman did, winter is coming. We have no wood. Your children will freeze. We have no food. Your children will starve. Please come home. And part of the reason they had no food and part of the reason they had no wood was when the British Army marched through, they were like locusts. They took all of these things. And this is why so many women, when the American army settled into winter quarters, picked up their children, their dogs, their favorite goat, you know, and went to Valley Forge and went to Monmouth and went to the safety of the American army. Those images of Valley Forge as a sort of all guy place are absolutely false. Valley Forge overnight became a bustling city with women, children, because they were seeking to escape from the ravages of the American Revolution. And I I hope schools will eventually come to terms with that and teach the American Revolution as it ought to be taught. In your book, you have a conversation, I think it's in the beginning, and you mentioned a few women that most people know. Abigail Adams, and then you say Molly Pitcher, and you said that's about all you know that's taught in schools. And Molly Pitcher right. wasn't even wasn't real. even a real person. <laughs> we have a standing joke that says that women bob up on the ocean of American history. La la Pocahontas. La 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 <laughs> Abigail Adams. La 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 uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. La, and otherwise, there. That has changed dramatically. I mean, now there really are women's studies departments, women's history departments. There are books. No history professor under the age of 50 is not going to assign books about women or books about African Americans and books about Native Americans in their class. But it really was phenomenal that the best known two people, two women in the American Revolution. One was imaginary, Molly Pitcher, and the other was Betsy Ross, who I promise you did not sew a flag. Betsy Ross (laughs) was an artisan. She was an upholsterer. She made furniture, the cloth part of furniture, and she was not going to take time out from her bustling business (laughs) to sew a flag. And so one was imaginary and one was mythological. And those were the two best-known women of the American (laughs) Revolution until 1980. There were Molly Pitchers, just like there were Rosie the Riveters in World War II. There was no woman named Rosie the Riveter. But all the wives who went to be with the army with their husbands, whose husbands were in the forts. These women were in the forts. 
And when the men fired the cannon, they would shout out, Molly Pitcher. Molly was a, a common nickname. And the message was, bring a pitcher of water. Now, when I first studied this, because I know nothing about cannons, I thought the water was for the husbands. You know, it was like, like Poland Springs, I'm thirsty. The water was to cool down the cannon so the men could reach inside again and reload the cannon. And so these women would run across the open spaces of the fort as the British were firing and, and their Indian allies were firing arrows in. And a lot of these women were wounded. I mean, they, they suffered war wounds as they were enacting their role as Molly Pitchers. And of course, New Jersey, bless its heart, has one woman rest stop, and it's called the Molly Pitcher rest stop after, after an imaginary woman. So all of these women were Molly Pitchers, just as all the women who worked in armaments factories in America in World War II were Rosie the Riveters. And so we have tried, people who are women's historians of the era, we have tried to introduce a whole range of other women and girls who were involved in the American Revolution. And hopefully they will become more common names among people who were educated, who were in grade school in the last half of the 20th century and now in the 21st century. There was one quote in your book. It was from, I hope I get her name right, Esther DeBert Reed. Yes. And it's pretty simple. It just says, we have a powerful enemy to contend with. The word we is a very powerful word. Yes, yes. And when I read that, I've said, all right, they don't see this just as a revolution that the men are going to be involved in. They realized they're going to be involved, or she realized she was going to be involved. Yes. And before I tell you what she did, you've hit on one of the most radical elements of the American Revolution was the immediate politicization of women. Women had been told for almost two centuries in America, do not concern yourself with public matters. Do not concern yourself with political matters. And in the years leading up to the Declaration of Independence, when Americans were protesting British taxation, the boycott that got a lot of those laws Britain passed repealed were on two items that involved women, British textiles and British tea. And they were at the heart, especially the textiles of the Industrial Revolution in England. And when Americans boycotted that, in those two items, in order to be successful, they needed women to agree. And women began to issue manifestos in the newspapers. Women's names never appeared in newspapers. And here were women in North Carolina, in Massachusetts, in Philadelphia, in rural areas of Virginia, who would publish announcements. We, the undersigned, have agreed not to drink or purchase tea until the Tea Act is repealed. And they would sign their names. And you begin to get women who call themselves daughters of liberty. And one of my favorite quotes is from a teenage girl who says, we have commenced perfect statesmen. So the women understood that they were involved in a political struggle. And men who had for years and years and centuries told them, be quiet, this is not your business, are suddenly singing their praises. One of my favorite characters is a minister from South Carolina who has been telling women in his sermons, obey your husbands, be silent in the church, don't involve yourself in... Well, gets a sermon and he says, 
the hills will sing the praises of our daughters of liberty. <laughs> so there is this astonishing transformation, more rapid than I think almost any event in American history was this emergence of women like Esther DeBert Reed, who are conscious that they are being political. She is the wife of the governor of Pennsylvania. And she and Benjamin Franklin's daughter, Sarah Franklin Bosch, organized the first major fundraising drive America has ever seen. They break every rule of etiquette. These are genteel women who are not supposed to be on the streets of Philadelphia without a male escort and are not supposed to talk to a man unless they are formally introduced. And they're going in groups of four into every single neighborhood of Philadelphia, knocking on doors. And if a man answers the door, they're asking for donations to the Continental Army. It's a phenomenal thing. And they raised $320,000 for Washington's army. And they send the game plan for how to do this to women in other states. And Esther DeBert is the genius behind this. And when they are criticized, she publishes something called Sentiments of an American Woman, which is this fundraising group's manifesto that cites all of the women throughout history in the Bible, Joan of Arc, all of the women who rose to the occasion and behaved in a patriotic fashion. And she says, in effect, we are like them. We are daughters of liberty. So she's a name that ought to be on the lips of every school child. I agree. You know, you had mentioned that the women a lot of times were left to deal with these British soldiers or Hessians, I guess. Yes. And those were individuals who believed in the spoils of war, including women. Right. And in the primary sources, they use the term ravish. Well, there's something way more insidious than that term. Yes. Could you explain what women had to deal with when these groups would come in maybe and just to sustain itself, but they were, uh, the women were left to deal with that. Yes. When the British Army marched from New York to Philadelphia, all along the route, there were gang rapes of women who had been sometimes whose husbands were there too, but were helpless to do anything. We have accounts of a woman and her 14-year-old daughter being gang raped by British soldiers. Now, I'm not going to defend the British soldiers, but let me explain this mentality. These were young British boys who had been sort of dragooned into the army. And they had been told to the victor belong the spoils. They had been told you're not going to be paid well and you're going to be whipped till you are a crackerjack soldier. But when we go to war, and everything is available for you. And among those things, because women were the property of their husbands, among those things were women's bodies. And not only were women raped, and it's hard to get an exact number because the women were humiliated and embarrassed and did not want to report it. New Jersey, the New Jersey legislature tried to get women to come forward so that they could prosecute or get the British Army to prosecute these men. And very few women would come forward because they were embarrassed and humiliated by what they had gone through. But we know that there was On Staten Island, let me give you an example. Staten Island was occupied by the British Army. And the commander there wrote in his journal, it is amusing to see, I'm paraphrasing, I don't remember the exact words. It's amusing to see that 
any young woman who ventures out of her home into her garden runs the risk of being ravished. He thought that was funny. He, he thought that was an amusing anecdote to remember to tell. So this was very real. It's also true that women's homes, as I said, were empty to furniture. If the British, if a regiment of British soldiers parked themselves nearby and it was cold, they went into the house and they took all the furniture and they burned it to create bonfires for themselves. And so these women, and they certainly took any farm animals they could, they went into their cellars and took all the food that had been preserved for the winter, which is why this woman was saying in that letter to her husband that I mentioned, we're going to starve and we're going to freeze. And they took the crop. So the women who were left at home to manage the farm not only faced scarcity of things that they needed because Britain stopped sending over salt and tins and household equipment because we were at war with them, but they faced a terrible danger whenever an army marched through their towns or through their villages. So they had their hands full, not only with their children, with now taking over their husband's job of raising the crop, but with this imminent danger that was always possible whenever British troops or loyalist troops arrived. It's no wonder that when the war was over, students always ask me, well, why didn't after the war, why didn't women demand the vote? Why didn't they demand? He said, all anybody wanted was that phrase that uses a word that is not really a word, a return to normalcy. They wanted to rebuild their lives. They wanted to rebuild the farm. The women wanted to go back to the work they knew in the household. Very few people wanted to discuss ideology. You know, well, how should we think about gender now? They, they just wanted peace and quiet and tranquility. And you can't understand that till you understand how brutal and long the American Revolution was. You painted a pretty vivid picture of those army camps. It wasn't just the American camps. It was the British camps as well. Yes, yes. Women play a crucial role. And in some cases, I think the phrase you used, um, it might have been from a British officer, a necessary nuisance. Yes. But could you explain the role of camp followers, the importance of those women in army camps? Yes. And then some of the problems that that generated. When I first started to work on this, I thought a camp follower was a prostitute. That that was my assumption that they were women who, you know, went into the camps to make money. Not so. The American army and the British army were able to keep the prostitutes out of encampments. But women flocked, as I said, to these encampments for safety, for food, for survival. Washington hated it. He wanted a professional army, just like the British had. And he was very upset by the presence of all these women and children running around in this encampment. But he knew that if he sent them home, their husbands would desert as well. Their husbands would go with them. And so he tolerated them. And tolerating them, he decided, I'll put them to work. They did the gathering of, it wasn't cow pies, it was deer pies to make fires and sticks and whatever were needed to make bonfires. They did the nursing of the soldiers because something they called camp fever, which was anything you got that made you sick, dysentery or whatever. They nursed in the encampment hospitals. They did the laundry for all of you didn't just do your husband's laundry. You did his whole regiment's laundry. You did the cooking so that you became a kind of a support network for the men in the encampment. And you were vital. One of the things that happened was the young boys in 
enlisted men were usually young, sometimes as young as 15, 16, and they were typical teenagers. They didn't wash their clothes. They didn't wash their bodies. And they developed lice. And the lice was so severe and their scratching was so severe that they had scabs all over their bodies. And the person in the regiment who was required to go around and see who was battle ready would report. Half of our men are covered in scabs everywhere. And when the women came into the, into the camps, they began to do the laundry for all of these men. And I jokingly, though, to some extent seriously say the American army wouldn't have been able to win any battles if the women hadn't been doing the laundry. So they were essential in the camps. On the other hand, on the other hand, (laughs) one thing they did was they, they provoked, if they got mad at one another, they provoked fights among the men too. That is, they could hurt the morale of the, the regimen by gossip and by by being mad at one another. The second thing that they did was they got pregnant. And frequently you can see in Washington's record book that he kept, I wanted to move the men from these divisions of the army quickly, but I couldn't because eight women were in labor and I had to wait till they gave birth. And so... They did slow down the movement of the army. There's no question about it. They they made it harder for the commanding officer, wherever they were, to maneuver. But they provided these vital services to the army, and they kept the men in the army. That is, they diminished the number of desertions. So it was a mixed a mixed bag. If Washington had had his way, he wouldn't have let any of them come in. But once they were there, he put them to to good use. And by the way, when the army was on the move again in the spring, many of these women traveled with the army. They did not go home. Some of them had no homes to go home to. And so They were sent out onto the battlefield to scavenge for weapons and coats and boots of dead and dying soldiers. And they could be wounded. We know that 250 women, at the very least, filed for veterans' pensions to the Confederation Congress. They didn't get them. But they filed for veterans' pensions because they had been wounded either in the fort, carrying the pitchers of water, or on the battlefield, scavenging for for supplies. So it was not easy to be a camp follower, I I will tell you that. And, And women in the town, as these army battalions or regiments marched by with these ragtag and bobtail women following them, which is what one soldier soldier called them. They looked like harrigans and unkind genteel women recorded with horror in letters to their friends. These women looked like they came straight from hell. They were they were unfeminine. They were, well, of course they were. They had been living in an army camp and marching behind the army for many months. And so I would say that they did not have an easy life uh, as camp followers. One of the women who was in the army camp was Martha Washington. Yes. And I was struck. I know George Washington, his image is very important comes clear a little bit that her image is important as the mother of the revolution. It's almost propaganda. Yes. Am, I, am I wrong yes. in that? that uh, and no. The wives of the generals all came to the army camp when they were in camp for the winter. 
they didn't want, most of them didn't want to. Martha Washington did not want to, but she wrote to one of her relatives, when he calls, I must go. They went to the army encampment, not for the sake to raise the morale, not of the enlisted men. This image that Martha Washington was sitting there knitting uh, socks for the enlisted men is baloney. They came for the officer corps to raise their morale. They gave dinner parties, and they didn't stay in the encampments, by the way. They stayed in houses that were confiscated from loyalists or that had been abandoned, and they were put up in nice quarters, and soldiers were assigned to work as their staff, you know, to work in the house. And they would give dinner parties for the young officers. They gave balls and dances for them. And it became apparent right away to young eligible women that this was the place to go to meet a husband. And so these balls and parties became matchmaking events. This is where Alexander Hamilton met his wife. I think Lynn manuel Miranda <laughs> covers that yes. in one of his songs. <laughs> yes, yes. So young women would go to visit their grandma or their aunt or their who were there as general wives. Now, some wives, I'm always fond of Lucy Knox. Lucy Knox was an only child, and her parents, she was Lucy Flucker Knox, and her parents were ardent supporters of the British crown. They were loyalists, and they left to England, and she was married to Henry Knox, who was a general in the American (laughs) army, and so she stayed, and she was very lonely. She writes him, we have their exchange of letters, and they've been published, and they're such interesting people. Both of them were extremely um, in, in my family, they would be called Zoftic, extremely fat. <laughs> That's what she was. And she would write to him, oh, she called him Harry. Oh, Harry, I miss you so. I come into the house and I am all alone. There is no one here for me. No one loves me. No one does it right. And so she couldn't wait until they settled into the winter encampment and she went lickety split to to be with her husband and to socialize with these other women and to have a wonderful time so much so that when it was time to leave she often didn't want to go and her husband had to force her to go home but for most of them like Katie Green and Nathaniel Green's wife and Martha Washington they saw themselves playing the role of showing the enlisted men that they were supporters of their husbands just as the enlisted men's wives were supportive of their husbands. But their main activities were raising the morale of of the young officers. And the parties they gave, no enlisted man was ever invited to them. In fact, they had a list of do's and don'ts, the way sometimes restaurants on the beach will have nobody can come in barefoot, nobody can come in without a shirt on. They said no one can come in with holes in their uniform. <laughs> so you had to you had to look spiffy to be admitted to a Martha Washington party or a Mar- Martha Washington ball. One of the chapters I really enjoyed was Spies, Saboteurs, Couriers, and Heroines. Oh, yeah. Could you explain? Yes. You know, there's this comment that's made that George Washington didn't really win on the battlefield. He just outspied the British. Could you explain women's roles in, in those capacities? Absolutely. This is my favorite chapter because nobody else had ever written about these women, really. And the reason they hadn't written about these women is that they're, most of these women don't leave any letters or diaries. Many of them couldn't read or write. And 
the way their stories were preserved was they were passed down over the generations in the family. It was an oral history tradition. And we all know that if you ever played the game of telephone, by the time the story gets around the entire circle, it's changed dramatically. Well, that's also true in, with oral history. So if there are five brothers and sisters and each one of them passes down the story to their children, the story changes. And so you get these stories about a woman. She was beautiful and young. No, she was old and ugly. She had red hair. No, she had brown hair. It was five loyalists who came to her house. No, it was 20 loyalists. And so historians are very touchy about that. And they didn't, no one wanted to use any of these stories because there was no document that they could guarantee them by. But by the time I wrote Revolutionary Mothers, women's history was well established and I could be a little more daring. And so I found the stories most of which, by the way, were preserved, bless their hearts, by the DAR. DAR chapters were named after many of these spies and saboteurs and messengers, and they gave me the family reminiscences, the family records of these young and old women. And you would be amazed how many women functioned in, in these roles. Any time a message had to be carried that went through British lines, there was some young teenage girl who carried the message. If the troops had to be mustered in, in Putnam County, New York, if a man who was in charge of that militia unit, his daughter rode out into the countryside and said, to arms, to arms. You must gather at our house. The funniest thing about this is no girl ever rode out on a clear, balmy night. All of these stories began, it was a dark and stormy <laughs> night. <laughs> All of them. All of them began. They run into Ichabod Crane on the way. And yes, stuff. <laughs> right. So this young woman in Putnam County, Sybil Ludington, is sometimes referred to as the Paul Revere, the female Paul Revere. And I said, au contraire, Paul Revere never completed his ride. He was arrested <laughs> by the British. He should be called the male Sybil Ludington because she completed her ride. So women carried messages, and that was particularly important in the South where the guerrilla fighters like the Swamp Fox and were trying to communicate with General Green's army when he came down to try to finally drive the British out. The second thing they did was they spied on the British and they played the role. They played up to the British assumption that women were frivolous and were not really interested in politics or war. And so they would more or less bat their eyelashes and say, oh, I'm just going to visit my my aging uncle who's ill. I have, you know, Little Red Riding Hood. I have a basket of food for him. Let me pass through. And, and meanwhile, she's checking out how many soldiers there are, how many weapons they have, how many, and reporting on it. It was fascinating how obtuse the British were about this. When Charleston was taken by the British, occupied by the British, matronly women would come into Charleston from the countryside because they needed to see the apothecary to get some medicine. And the British never stopped them. They never searched them. And inside their petticoats were messages from the guerrilla fighters to be brought into, into the city to the resistance. Women were essential in communication roles. They were essential in spying roles. And there's a wonderful woman in Philadelphia when the British occupied Philadelphia, Lydia Dara, whose husband was a very noted undertaker. They took over her house. They commandeered her house. 
and they commandeered a room in the house to be their meeting room, the the officers when they wanted to plan strategy. And she had the nerve to go and listen at the door. And her problem was how to get the information to Washington's army at Valley Forge. Her son was in Washington's army, and she somehow managed to communicate to him how the messages would be carried about what these British officers were planning. They sewed them into the coats of corpses who were being carried out of town because they didn't want to bury them in town. So if you died in town and her husband was the undertaker, they were carried out of town and the British didn't stop that from happening. And then when they got out into the countryside, they would open all the coffins and they would see who had messages inside the coats of these dead people. And Lydia Darrow risked her life because, in fact, if she had been caught with her ear to the door and her eye to the keyhole, she would have been imprisoned. And women would go into the British camp pretending to be to be selling supplies. And they would sell hats, they would sell scarves, they would sell, sell whatever the soldiers alcohol, whatever the soldiers might want. And they would go into the British camp. And one of them that I know of was an artillery officer's wife. And she knew a lot about artillery. And she went into the camp and she came out and she reported exactly how many guns they have, exactly how to the American army. So they were very important as spies in both directions, by the way. There were women who spied for the British Army as well. So they were spies, they were messengers, and they were saboteurs in the South again, because that's where the two major British campaigns were. The guerrilla fighters would leave ammunition and weapons in the homes of patriot women in the basement, right? If the British or the loyalists got wind of these supplies being buried at a home, they would march on this home and they would demand that the woman turn over these things. We have accounts, and I have them in the book, of women who burned down their home and exploded the ammunition that was in that home to prevent the British from getting those supplies. We have accounts of, and I also have this woman in the book, of a woman who came out with a ceremonial sword that her husband had over the fireplace and threatened to kill the first loyalist soldier who came near her home. We have women who burned their crops and risked starvation to keep the British Army from getting those crops. In fact, one of the reasons Burgoyne surrendered at Saratoga was his army was starving. And Catherine Schuyler set fire to vast fields of wheat so that they couldn't get the wheat and feed the soldiers. So they sabotaged their own homes, their own crops, to advance the patriot cause, which is really, I think, quite extraordinary that almost no one knows about this. Well, they know about it now if they read Revolutionary Mothers. And there are so many really funny stories. My two favorite are Mammy Kate, who was black slave woman, who was a big husky, six-foot-tall woman who is the slave, along with her husband and her children, of Stephen Hurd, who was a very diminutive five-foot-one planter. <laughs> and he was captured by the, by the loyalists and the British 
and taken to the fortress in Augusta, Georgia. He was going to be hanged. Mammy Kate, and this also t- tells you about the complexities of slavery. Mammy Kate did not celebrate this. She said, how dare they do this? I'm going to rescue him. And she got up on Stephen Hurd's white horse and rode to Augusta. She parked her horse outside of town. I'm reminded of all the gun smoke. This, this dates me. All the gun smoke episodes where they were going to get someone out of jail and they put their horses out of town. She went into town. She stole another horse and brought it out to where she was hiding her horse. And she put a basket on her head. And she went to the fortress and she said, I'm a poor black woman, but I'm a great laundress. Will you, do you have any clothes you want me to launder? And these men are always looking for someone to launder their clothes. So they said, sure, Mammy Kate. And they gave them her, gave her their clothes. And for three weeks, four weeks, she would come in with the basket with the clean clothes and pick up the dirty clothes and leave. And one week she comes in, she says, would you mind if I went among your prisoners and see, see if they had anything of value they could give me to launder their Sure, Mammy Kate, go on in. And she went in, and of course she went to Stephen Hurd, and she took the laundry out, and she brought it back, and she took the laundry out and brought it back. And one day she took the laundry out on her head, the basket on her head, and guess who was in the basket? (laughs) Stephen Hurd. She rescued him. He became the first governor of Georgia. And as a reward, he freed her entire family. They never left the plantation. And Mammy Kate is buried in the Stephen Hurd Family Cemetery. So that's one of my favorite stories. That's a great story. <laughs> my second favorite story, if you'll indulge me. Absolutely. Nancy Hart, also on the Georgia border. Now, her family, some say she was young, some she say she was old, some say she was uh, blonde, some say she had red hair, whatever. She was alone in her cabin with her young daughter when five, or maybe it was four, or maybe it was six, loyalist troops came to the door, and they said, we are hungry, we demand that you feed us. And Nancy Hart said, sure, come on in. I'll just go out with my daughter and I'll slaughter a pig so I can give you a meal. And they went out into the barnyard and she said to her daughter, you go find some American troops and tell them there are five loyalists in my house. And the girl ran off. And Nancy Hart cooked a fabulous meal. And while it was being prepared, she plied them with corn liquor and hard cider so that by the time they sat down, they were several sheets to the wind. They came, the aroma of the food was just amazing, and they came to the table, and Nancy Hart goes, Oh, no, you don't. Gentlemen, do not sit down at the table in my house with their weapons. You put your guns, your bayonets over in that corner. And they were starving. And they said, sure. And they piled their guns up in the corner. And as soon as they sat down, Nancy Hart picked up one of those guns and held them prisoner for several hours until Patriot troops came and captured them. So the question was, How on earth did an elderly woman hold five strapping young men prisoner for four or five hours? And the answer was that Nancy Hart was incredibly cross-eyed. And the men said no one could tell who she was aiming at. So they were all (laughs) afraid to get up. (laughs) Now, I don't know how much of that story is real. I really don't. But Nancy Hart went to every one of their hangings 
And it was said by all the oral history that was passed down that she sang Yankee Doodle while they died. <laughs> so, this is an incredible <laughs> frontier character. So there are just so many really fabulous tales about these these women that I try to cram as many of them as I could in, into that chapter on spies and saboteurs and messengers. I'd like to ask about one who actually isn't in your book, but um, it's Peggy Shippen. And yeah. is it overstated her role in helping turn Benedict Arnold, which I think that whole, he's just fascinating to me. Yes, um, he is. I've been in the army for 26 years. I'm an army officer. So you know, it's just fascinating to me how that entire situation occurred. Is that overstated? Well, the story is long. He was not a wealthy man. He was a, a drug, really, a, an apothecary before the war. And he was a brilliant strategist. I mean, he was a great soldier. But he didn't have a lot of money, right? And he was always disgruntled about his pay and about his fame. Washington adored him. Washington really thought of him as, you know, one of the many men he thought of as his son because he had no children. Benedict Arnold was put in charge of, he was like the commissary head when the Americans took back Philadelphia. And there was a great social scene among very wealthy Philadelphians, and that's where he met Peggy Shippen. And he could not really keep up with the scene because he didn't have a lot of money, and he embezzled money from his commissary budget. And Washington protected him. Washington made sure that he was not ever put on trial. But it was clear that two things were operating for Benedict Arnold. He didn't think he was being promoted rapidly enough, and he wanted money to support Peggy Shippen in the style because she was, came from a very wealthy family. She had, her, her family were not patriots, and she had no particular sense of loyalty to the American army. But historians disagree about what role she played actively, but her mere presence played a role. That is, she increased the tendency of Benedict Arnold to be disgruntled and to want more money. And the British offered him a higher rank and a higher salary, you know, a a, a big salary. Had he married someone else, he might not have deserted the American army. But marrying a woman who needed to be kept in style and who said to him, gee, this is a great opportunity for you. You would be an officer in the British army. And I think that was probably enough to lead him to decide to be a traitor to the American cause. Other historians really do think that she was the one who whispered endlessly in his ear, you're not appreciated, you're not appreciated by, by the Americans, look what the British can do for you, look how well we could live. We don't really know what she did. Nobody wrote down a record of Peggy Shippen is whispering in his ear, but she may very well have done so. I will tell you that when the jig was up and he fled, Peggy Shippen jumped into her bed in a negligee and let her hair down. And when the Americans came in, when Washington came in, she went, oh, woe is me. I had no idea this was happening. What will become of me? So, you know, she was a, a survivor. Ultimately, he was given a cushy general's rank, and he never amounted to much, however, in the British Army. He never performed remarkably well for them. Uh, but it, he, Washington fell into a deep funk for several months. Washington was 
destroyed by the desertion of someone who he had helped and promoted and protected and who he really cared for. It's a very, uh, it was a very terrible blow to Washington's psyche that Benedict Arnold deserted. Maybe she played um, an active major role. I just don't really don't, I don't think anybody really knows. Well, the last question I have for you, I have to commend you that somehow you weaved Warren Gamaliel Harding into Revolutionary Mothers. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, you know, that nice job there. Um, but you talked about there was this need to get back to, and I'll just use his word, normalcy. Yes. But were there any lasting effects of all of these roles that you've mentioned? Yes. Yes. The answer is yes. Not for the average farm life, really, but for the genteel classes among the intelligentsia of the American Revolution. They engaged in a great debate about the role of women in a republic. The revolution had confirmed that something that in earlier colonial times was not believed. It was always believed that women's brains were small and weak and they couldn't think rationally and thus they couldn't tell right from wrong, which is the, the justification for them being under the thumb of their husbands because they would destroy civilization if they were off on their own. The Enlightenment and the role women played in the American Revolution persuaded the thinking classes, we'll call them, the elite classes, that women could indeed think rationally, that they could choose right from wrong, they had chosen liberty, they had chosen patriotism, and so no longer could you say women had no brain. That was an important step forward, believe me. I mean, after the revolution, among the middle and upper classes, it was no longer believed that women were like idiots and children incapable of thinking. But they didn't, no man thought of giving women the vote or giving women a political voice or giving women, giving uh, opening up Harvard University to them or giving them uh, uh, careers. I mean, none of that was on anybody's agenda. It wasn't even on the agenda of the women in this intelligentsia. What they did give them was what women's historians have come to call a civic role. You were still in, in the domestic sphere, but in that sphere, it now was your job to raise patriotic children to raise children who would be willing to sacrifice to help the republic survive. Before the revolution, socializing your children was the job of the husband, not the wife, because she couldn't think rationally. After the revolution, women were to educate, we would call it socialize, they didn't have that term, their sons and daughters, about their role in a republic, about their role as patriots. And they called that Republican motherhood. And that was a status revolution for these women. And the women turned, once you start a change in ideology and gender, you, you can't always predict where it's going to go. So the women in these classes turned around and said, we accept that role, but how can we do this properly if we don't know the history of the evolution of the British and the American government? How can we do this if we don't know moral philosophy? How can we do this if we don't know the kinds of things that will help us teach our children? We need to be educated. And so one of the great lasting legacies of the American Revolution is the rise of young ladies' academies. 
schools for young women. Now, farmers' daughters didn't go to them. This was strictly for the genteel classes. But the curriculum, because administrators are always lazy, was the same as the curriculum for boys in what we would call today prep schools for for college. So they studied philosophy, they studied geography, they studied history, they studied mathematics, they studied science in these young ladies' academies. And they studied them together as a group. And we all know what happens when people get together who are being educated. They begin to say, gee, my dissatisfaction isn't just me. This isn't something wrong with me. This is something wrong with our society. That is, these women in these young ladies' academies began to think, you know, things could be different for women. And then we would be more fulfilled. And then we could do something with our education. And Americans forget, all people forget, that the 70 years between the end of the revolution and Seneca Falls, is a tiny blip in history. Very quickly, with education and with the admission that women could think independently, you begin to get a campaign for women's equality and women's rights. And this comes out of, this is the legacy of the American Revolution. And so big changes did come. They just took a while for them to really reach fruition in the demand for female equality. Well, thank you, Dr. Birkin. That was a lot of fun. Thank you. And I'm sure I babbled on and on and on. I, I apologize. <laughs> but <laughs> I enjoyed it all. This <laughs> is a subject near and dear to my heart. So. <laughs> and it was a pleasure to talk with you. It really was. I would like to thank my guest once again, Dr. Carol Birkin you would like to read her lively and entertaining book, Revolutionary Mothers, Women in the Struggle for America's Independence, simply click on the link in the show description below. You will not be disappointed. Our featured brew, in honor of our revolutionary mothers, was Everyday Hero Session IPA from the Revolution Brewery of Chicago, Illinois. Remember to subscribe to the podcast. Simply hit the subscribe button and get new shows immediately after they are released. Subscribing is the only way to get new episodes right away. If you liked our conversation today with Dr. Birkin, please share it with a friend or on social media. And thank you to the growing list of listeners from around the globe and across the United States. The music was provided by the great band Bones Fork, who are working on new material as we speak, and that will be released very soon. You can purchase their music wherever you buy your music online. There are many more great episodes on the way, including on the Civil War, A Tales from the Gym City, and the Vatican's Secret Search for the Tomb of St. Peter. So join us again next time when we talk, think, and drink on History of Go-Go. <laughs>